Welcome. I am sitting here today with Dana Bergren, who is, she's lots of things, Dana. I'm excited to talk about all of your hats. Uh, mm -hmm. Most relevant to our audience, the owner of the Coop uh, co-working space, to, which now has two locations in the Las Vegas market. And she's also a commercial real estate broker. And Dana, you are like under your own shingle for yes. the real estate business. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. So, okay. Tell us a little bit about your real estate background and then your co-working story, how you um, got to do co-working. And I don't even think I, maybe we talked about this. I was thinking we met in New York, right? Is that the first time we, we met in person at the GWA we, conference? We did. We yeah. met in New York in, was it October of 2017? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, let me see what, firstly, I have, I have Kelly here really quickly. She has to come and say hi. Kelly was part of the co-working community manager. Oh, yes. <laughs> hi, Kelly. Good to see you. <laughs> She's taking a picture. Anyway, so yes, I met you in... Um, October of 2017, that was my first GWA. And how I came to that conference was interesting because being a commercial real estate broker, and um, I've been licensed since 1997, 25 years, I've had my real estate license, which to me is just uh, it's wild, my, yes. <laughs> mind blowing how it goes so fast. So um, I, uh, I got to, so I used to be on the board of NAAP which is a commercial real estate organization. And as I'm planning the um, opening of the first Coop co-working location, I start following you and your Everything Co-working podcast. And um, it turns out that the GWA was postponed. It was supposed to be in Florida because of another hurricane yep. and that it was postponed and that you were merging it with NAOP, which to me was like worlds colliding. Right. So um, I got the chance to meet you at the GWA in Brooklyn, New York. And yes. I remember fangirling and telling you that I was fangirling because here you are CrossFit. We all know you do CrossFit and you look amazing and you're wearing a red jumpsuit. Oh, that's you right. Are just, <laughs> I, 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 jump still, suit. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and you are facilitating this meeting. And um, I was just fangirling because I think I, like many other people, we we listen to you religiously. You get us through so many difficult times with, you know, planning our spaces and, you know, we can be on cruise control for so long and then something happens. We hit like a little blip or something. And it's like, I got to go back to everything co-working because <laughs> I know there's an episode on that. So um, just, I want to thank you for having me on. This is such a huge honor as someone who's, you know, been following you for so many years and um you know how nice it was to meet you and then to have gone to you know many conferences since then and um you know get to meet people in person who you know, uh you know we listen to and follow so yeah that's uh so that's where we met but i guess the um longer uh, <laughs> version of the story so I got my real estate license in 1997 in Chicago. I'm a native of Chicago. Born That's right. We had that in common because I spent yes. 15 years there and I remember talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. So much, uh, so much in common. And um, so um, moved to Las Vegas in 2002 since I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. I lived in the city and it was, I was about to get married and it's like, you know, do we stay in Chicago and you know, raise the family or do we move? And it was like, well, let's try something different. Let's go somewhere for a few years. And now here I am in Vegas 20 years later and um, just really uh, loving everything about Vegas. Um, so I've been in commercial real estate since, uh, since 1997. I've been in real estate and then moved to Vegas and been doing real estate. I worked in corporate commercial real estate I was um, most recently at uh, Cushman and Wakefield 
And then I went to Avis and Young, which I know you, you know, I hadn't have. realized that. And I saw that on your yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. Yep. You have the Avis and Young on people and uh, Avis and Young people on. And um, so I was there in 2014. I left corporate commercial real estate and I knew um, you know, I, 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 once I decided I was going to stay on my own, uh, it was, I needed to find an office for myself and the concept of co-working was just starting and I just really resonated with that, you know, community, uh, you know, type of feel that, uh, that was, that was one of the parts I liked about corporate commercial real estate. There was a lot of it that I don't like <laughs> and, um, some of it that I do like was the sitting around the table and talking yeah. about who's working on what, but you know, who's out there and just, you know, the, the small talk with people. So once I decided to stay on my own in real estate, it was like, well, I need to office somewhere. And I looked around at some of the options that were in Las Vegas at the time. And it was either, um, you know, too corporate and closed off, or it just, you know, some places were full, some weren't in the ideal location. So it, it was, was kind of quiet in 2014. So we hosted the GWA conference in Vegas in 2016. And it was like premier Regis, and then one like independent operator. And it was mm -hmm. mostly right. Executive sweet seat versus co-working mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. 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 So yeah, Las Vegas is is a unique, you know, animal in that respect, which is what I, I like about it. It's it's different. It's, to me, it's different than anywhere else. And I can go anywhere else and always be excited to come back uh, to Las Vegas. So um, that's what I, you know, kind of I set out to do was open up a place where I want to work, where I feel comfortable. I can share space with some other cool business owners. And um, that's what I started, uh, started the planning seriously for the coop in about 2015. So you um, tell me about your space search. Did you, did you lease that building? I can't remember your, stru so yeah, the, your structure. Yep. So the first location in Summerlin, we are in 4,000 square feet and that's in Summerlin, which is about a 20 minute drive west of the, the strip okay. and um originally i was going to open downtown but just the timing of it didn't work downtown and the more people i put the feelers out to because what was at the time it was build your community you need to build your community first, first mm -hmm. and then uh you know find the space but i don't know for me every i kept putting it out to people uh, you know hey who wants to share an office with me and they're like where is it I'm like, well, it's in my head right now. Right. <laughs> so it was just one of those things where it's like, you know what? You can only plan it and plan it. I can only listen to so many podcasts. Right. <laughs> but it's, then it's just like, it. you know what? You, we got to jump in and do it. So being a commercial real estate broker, I know exactly what landlords are looking for when I was looking for space. So to be the tenant out there looking for space, it was like, okay, what's your history? How long have you been doing co-working? Let me see right. the financials, the pro forma, the, all of that stuff. And it was, you know, one of my very good friends, uh, he wanted to buy a building and he said, how about you find a building to buy and I'll put you in there as the tenant. So the first one came about where I found the building to buy and I um, invested money in the building as well. So now I was part owner of the building and I was the tenant. So we were, it was a four tenant building. So about a 10,000 square foot building of which I occupied roughly 42% of the building. And then we had a few other tenants, uh, you know, separate entities. Uh, adjacent to us. And this is a single story garden style building, which is typical of what you'll find in Las Vegas. Um, you know, that's more of the, the suburban kind of, you know, feel to it. So where you park your car and just walk up to the door. So um, yeah, so that we found that building in November of 16 and started, uh, we, we closed on it and started the construction and we opened about February or March of 2017. So it's been almost, almost six years in Summerlin. Wild. So I, yeah, I love that you shared that because 
I, we talk a lot on the podcast about, you know, s- real estate structure and how mm-hmm. important it is, which, you know, as a broker, um, and the, your approach is, is a creative way to get into part of the building ownership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you got kind of lucky. You had a friend who, you know, said, yeah, let's do this. Let's, and then you bought some equity and without having to come up with the equity to buy the entire building on your own and finance that and then became a tenant. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. And your new location has a even like different sort of creative structure. So, right. okay. So 4,000 feet, what did the um, mix look like in terms of office and, and open space in the original location? The original location was very office intensive. It was a former real estate office when we bought the building. So it was um, a lot of offices. It was very dark. It was a lot of, um, you know, tans and browns, you know, reminiscent of the mid 2000s, you know, construction in Las Vegas. So um, I had uh, a couple of friends and again just being in commercial real estate having some of my furniture friends and you know designers and architects and stuff just take a look at it and it's like well if you eliminated that whole back row of offices along the windows you can do some open space um you know and so that was really the the planning that went into it new carpet new paint we did you know a lot of the grays and and whites and you know just brightened it up a bit um, and, and a lot of what I did and continue to do as well is feature some local components to it. So we've got some local furniture makers here in town, some oh, wow. local artists. We serve locally roasted coffee. So for me, um, you know, being in a city where a lot of people are from other places yeah. in Las Vegas, right. we've all you know, a lot, I do have a lot of local friends, but a lot of people come from other places. So to have that local feel to it means a lot to me. So, uh, and to support local businesses. So where we can, I mean, obviously the mass desks and, you know, the sit stands and, you know, all of that, those are going to be more of the, you know, mass produced kind of stuff, but our conference tables, um, you know, the artwork and stuff where we can, we feature local uh, people because it just, it tells a story and it, and it supports our community. Yeah. And so at the time when you originally thought downtown, you know, you made the point, like, sometimes you just have to start and you don't have all the answers, but people were telling you suburbs, they didn't want to be on the strip. So you you had that due diligence, like right location. Right. At the time, um, you know, downtown Las Vegas was more of the, you know, for, uh, a, a lot of attorneys, Uh, who need to be downtown by the courthouses. You've got your Fremont area, now the up and coming arts district and stuff like that. But, um, you know, at the time, it just, um, you know, the more people I would talk to about, you know, downtown, they're like, well, if you do it in Summerlin, we're in basically. And then I'm starting to think about it too, because, you know, I'm like, wait, my kids, you know, my kids are in Summerlin, my kids are in school in Summerlin. So yeah, I want to work near the house. I want to be, you know, close by to where if I need to scoot out and, and pick up a kid, um, you know, that, that I'm nearby to do that. So it's, it was more conveniently located to be in Summerlin for the first location. So, okay. So fast forward, you survive a pandemic (laughs) <laughs> I don't know how, yeah, what I, whatever your definition of surviving is, I'm here. <laughs> You're, I know. That's kind of how I felt when I saw it. we were just at the GWA conference, mm-hmm. last, wait, the week before last. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I kind of got that feeling from some folks like, well, we're here. Yeah, so we're exactly. Just, you know, <laughs> putting that behind us. And mm-hmm. well, so although talk a little bit about what, w- what was your relationship like? So you had some equity in the building, but you still have rent to pay. So is that, yeah. is that still kind of like a negotiation with the building it's, owner? Who's your friend presumably? Yeah, exactly. still... yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he's a, a, a very good friend and uh, yeah, but it's still at the end of the day, it's business, right? There's investors and they want their return. So yeah, I do have equity in the building, but the equity is tied to how much I'm paying in rent. So it's just, you know, it's, um, you know, that scenario has worked 
thus far and listening to some of your podcasts as well. Um, you know, I, I did listen to your recap and I um, was not able to make it to the latest GWA in Frisco, um, but just listening to the takeaways from it and the different structures, you know, it's just, um, Every situation is so unique, as you've told me when I've reached out to you many times for advice, you know, I'm like, Jamie, I need to talk to you. Um, you know, every situation is unique. So, you know, can you take down, um, you know, with this new coop location that we opened, it's almost 20,000 square feet. Do you have the wherewithal to take down a 20,000 square foot building? Do you want to do a straight lease? management agreements. I mean, there's so many different ways to look at it and all of them have, you know, pros and cons. I'm looking, you know, I'm listening to, uh, yeah, and I'm also a member of your management agreement course. Um, I've sent, uh, you know, my members, my staff through manager university and I, cause, because I appreciate you putting out that content and you, you give so much um, you know, information that, uh, you know, it's a, my pleasure to, to be a part of and support um, all the things, the initiatives that you do in order to make, you know, the, you know, co-working um, industry uh, better. So, um, you know, you can look at doing management agreements, but, you know, with that, it's, you know, uh, now you've got a partner. Right. And as someone who's gone through a, a real life divorce and, you know, business relationships that yeah. have failed and stuff like that, it's just like you really have to plan for that stuff. You might start off with the best of intentions and, you know, everyone is all but then, you know, people start to get their own ideas of how things should be. Uh, but then on the flip side with a lease, it's, it's all on you. Totally. And, uh, Trade-offs. He, yeah, it's all pan, about the, yes, yeah, the risk profile, pan, which yeah, looks yeah. different for, and risk isn't necessarily financial. It's like you said, like sometimes it's the relationships and, and how, yeah. How intertwined yeah. do you want to get? And pandemic or not, the, right. the rent, the rent is still due. The mortgage is still due. I mean, it's just, you know, all of that stuff. So it's just really, you know, just aligning yourself with good people and hoping that, you know, you can work things out. So talk about kind of your mindset in terms of going from 4,000 feet, you survive a pandemic, and now you're in 20,000 square feet. In addition, right. you still have the original space. So yeah, what mm -hmm. what was it that made you kind of take the leap? And what were some of the things you were thinking about getting into such a big space? Mm -hmm. Well, it was, um, I had been wanting to expand the coop, but it was always, we talk ourselves out of doing things, right? You're like, I've got this one space, I'm running it. It's so much work. We're going through, uh, you know, shutdowns and, you know, we don't really, you feel like out of control. So it's like, yeah. do I just, you know, hunker down and keep doing this one? Or, you know, if the goal is to expand and to bring flexible office, to the community at large, then, you know, we have to seek out these opportunities. So um, my friend, Sonia, um, who is um, president of NABO, National Association of Women Business Owners. I know, you so are so like active in the community. <laughs> I was looking at your LinkedIn. I was like, this girl is like always <laughs> doing something. And your LinkedIn, I mean. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm so tired, you but need you know a vacation. What? We'll have to talk exactly. about that afterwards. It's, <laughs> it's better, but it's better than the alternative. Right. And it's that, that to me, again, that's the best part of co-working is, is it's creating the community. Yeah. That's, that's why I do all the stuff. I went from the board. I was on the board of CCIM, which is commercial real estate to NAOP, commercial real estate. And then when I went out on my own, I found that my values of a woman business owner were more aligned mm. in line with National Association mm. of Women Business Owners. Yeah. But I, my co-working space is co-ed. I love working with men. I have two older brothers. So I just, I, you know, it's just for me, it was a woman business owner. I just thought that that organization resonated for me. And I met uh, my friend Sonia 
and she needed new office space at the time. And she had said, uh, you know, she wanted to be in the south, southwest part of Vegas. And so we just really, um, I said, well, I want to expand the coop. So we set out to find a building and she runs mastermind groups and stuff like that. So she's very into to, yeah. Yeah, business coaching and, and helping you know, people. And so the, the Coop Summerlin has one small conference room, one large conference room, which seats about eight to 10 around the table and then a phone room. And that's it. So that's, really, you know, when you're in 4,000 square feet, and like you've said on your podcast, you are really, you know, kind of landlocked there. There's not a whole lot more you can expand and do. So while it's a safer number, makes me feel that monthly nut feels a whole lot better. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, if we want to offer people now, we've got three phone rooms, we've got two small conference rooms, we have two large conference rooms, uh, and then we have a classroom. So those have been renting unbelievable. And that's, and we have a large atrium space too, when you walk into our entryway, and that has also served as event Event space. space. I can picture that from your layout. That's great. Yeah. And it's just interesting hearing, uh, you know, um, uh, your previous podcast, I think with um geo and nick you had talked about um you know oh, the, the efficiency atrium yeah yeah <laughs> and how like, atriums wait. are like a total disaster wait, I'm like, I, wait, I have an atrium <laughs> and it works so it's just it's one of those yes. things right it's like people can opine about something in their experience but i think all of our experiences are unique I think it's really operator driven in so many ways. So right. Nick's pro forma experience is mostly from IWG, which is Regis, right? Mm -hmm, So they're, yeah, they, I mean, they really have kind of a formula for their layouts and, Mm -hmm. and they would, they don't do events. Mm -hmm. I, I would guess they don't, they just don't. I wonder if any of them have even like a classroom training style space mm-hmm. because that's not their model, right? They sell mm-hmm. offices, right. but if, you, so it's really about your experience as an owner and a little intuition, right? Like, what do I think I can make happen here? Mm-hmm. So totally. Right. And I, and I think the being able to, because, so we moved into an office in um, uh, December, we closed on this building, December of 21, we closed on this, you know, roughly 20,000 square foot building. We did some modifications to the building because again, it was built in, you know, 0506. So it's got, you know, needed some updating, but I have found in my experience that it's, uh, you know, you want to give people the nice new fresh space, but you can't go overboard on that stuff. Well, when I hear you talk in your podcast about, you know, 150, 200 bucks a foot, I like, who is paying for that? And what's the payback on that? So if you want to get up and running and opening immediately, uh, you know, you do what you can and just, I guess, what is it? Build the plane as you're flying it. It's just, you know, and, and hopefully you've got some flexibility like this office here um, was built by a real estate developer. So some of the finishes in here are super high end and beautiful. We're close to the strip. So, um, you know, we've got larger offices here. Um, which which I, was I was worried about. Yeah. So how are those going? Yeah, <laughs> they're going, they're going, you know, some, some people it's just, you know, they're like, I just need a tiny little room and a door. So what we did, we took one of our upstairs rooms that we were going to make a podcast room and we turned that into a small office and it rented. So we, lo- that was able, that made us able to capture a lower price point. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, so we rented that. And then I took one of my phone rooms, uh, the three phone rooms that we have, I took one with a huge window, but it is still a tiny office. And we have that one available for day pass users who want an office, a day office, a Mm -hmm. day office. And then, um, that one's available too. So it's really just, um, just re reconfiguring and being flexible 
for those needs that come in. I can't run, I think you had said something, or maybe it was, uh, was it Geo who had said something about taking, uh, you know, a 160 square foot office and just running a wall down it and making it two 80 yep. square footers. I mean, you know, you've got to run a wall down the middle. Now you've got two doors, two framing, yep. two, all of that stuff. And even so- doors with construction costs today. I have some members, somebody put in a door, I think it was $20,000 just to put the door in, right? Wow. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So you really, yeah, you, you have to do that stuff early and let it, and to your point, do you have to move HVAC? Do you have to move sprinklers? Like right. what else do you have to do? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So it's just one of those things where it's, Uh, you just learn that lesson from the first time around is that it's not going to be perfect. And people who are looking for, you know, space, you know, some people are just the, what's the dollar per square foot? What's the, what's the size of the office and what's the cost? They just care about what's inside those, those four walls. Um, and then there's other people who they want to belong somewhere. Yeah. They want that sense of community. And so it's really, Wait, so trying- I'm curious as a, as a commercial real estate broker. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you really, it's not, I don't talk to too many brokers who are also operators. So you have a pretty mm-hmm. unique approach. Do you t- divert the conversation when it starts focusing on square feet? Like mm-hmm. what am I paying? Because the rate they're paying for the square feet is high right compared to market rent do how do you handle that conversation well it's gotten a lot easier now the first go around in 2016 2017 um you know when you're trying to sell you know offices to people or rent offices to people it was just like wait for how big of a space and you're like well you're also sharing in the cost of the common areas the utilities it's a flat fee it's the, you know, Move in ready, all the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some people, you know, some people, they, they don't care. They'll just, they, they'll rent an office in, uh, you know, if an attorney or a CPA just has some extra offices, you know, they'll just go they'll in there. Wherever. And yeah. Yeah. They'll do their thing. And, you know, part of me is, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an extrovert. I like meeting people. I like creating the relationship in both of my co-working spaces. I have offices available to me and I sit in the open space all the time. You know, it's uh, it, it, the Coop South. Uh, people smile. They walk in and look and see if I'm there because now I run between the two right, locations. Right, yeah. So they're looking to see if I'm, you know, perched at my, you know, cozy spot on the couch in the atrium. But that's to me, that's where the good stuff happens, yeah. right? That's where the people keep coming back because it's, you know, they come in and they know that there's going to be a little conversation. I get zero work done. Right. I was um, just thinking, I was like, <laughs> and you get nothing done while you're sitting there. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but just, you know, the, the conversations and the, you know, the talking and, you know, we, uh, I bring in breakfast each, so I'm, you know, telling people too, I bring in breakfast, um, in Summerlin, it's the first Tuesday morning of each month. At South, it's the third Tuesday morning. It's called Feed at the Coop. Nice. And we use um, one of our members as a catering company. And I was using a different place to provide the food. And then when I had met this uh, you know, catering company, they signed up for a membership. And it was like, well, I do this breakfast. And it's supporting those who support us. And, you know, that's just a, you know, classic example of, of, you know, co-working and yeah. being a part of that, that community. So, you know, some people really like the feed uh, at the coop and just, um, you know, sit and, and talk to each other, get to know each other on a more personal level. And other people, they'll grab a plate and go back into their office and other people won't show up at all. But it's just, it's interesting when you, you know, community events and stuff like that, people want to know what you do. Do you do community events? Do you do this? And then you're like, but are you going to attend? Totally. But maybe they show up. They just, it's optionality. They just want to know they can, if they want right. to. It's so human behavior is so interesting and unpredictable. It is. <laughs> Okay. So I want to just re- keep uh, revisit your larger offices. So mm-hmm. in general, was your approach with the building that like, do you have a fixed price for each office? How are you 
sort of managing like the imperfect size, like, sure, you know what I mean? Like if mm-hmm. you were to build from scratch, maybe you'd have 10, you know, 90 square foot offices, mm-hmm. but you don't, they're, some of them are bigger. Right. Some of, yeah. How are well, you kind of approaching that? Well, and that's the thing, because I think about it all the time. I could go into a shell building and build from scratch, yeah. but it, I I wouldn't even know what to do because it's, you know, I I don't know what that perfect size it looks says, like because it, yeah. Summerlin is totally different from mm. South. It's like every space, people who have multiple spaces now, I'm sure can attest that each space has its own yeah. personality. So I I wouldn't even know you know, what, if I had a blank slate, I, that it, to me, it's probably more comforting to get an existing building and try to get a good deal on that building and then just figure out how to make that work. Um, so um, my offices, I would say average about 200 square feet. Each. Which is a huge office for co-working. It's funny it depends because on the market. Yeah. It, yeah. Cause you know, when I was in, uh, when I went to Brooklyn and I was flying back to Vegas from uh, after your conference back in 2017, I went into a co working space. I cannot for the, I think it was maybe Commons or something. It was in, it was in Brooklyn. And I went into the co working space and the private offices were maybe six inches around a desk. And I'm thinking yeah. this is a private office. And, and then you're in Vegas, which is like the open, you know, yeah. the wild west out here and people like their space, their space, you know, yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just different. Um, so um, the, but yeah, I, I think it, we're, we are a good size for a lot of people. Uh, the 200 square feet is definitely larger than they need. So, um, you know, that's why we introduced that smaller office kind of concept, but then that's too small. So it's, um, I don't know if you'll ever be a perfect fit for everybody, but, um, you know, so uh, the 200 square foot office can hold roughly, you know, three, four people, some people cram in more desks than that um but um and then we also give people the flexibility in pricing so we um where in Summerlin we were more of a month-to-month type of situation here people wanted to lock in for a longer term so we do you know the month-to-month is going to be a higher price point and then we do a six-month term and a 12-month with discount you know so it gives people I find that if you give people more choices, instead of just saying, this is what's available, take it or leave it. I think if you give people choices um, of what they can do and how they can use the space, then um, I I think that that works better. So you mentioned that the Vegas commercial market is still pretty spicy. Can you talk about, yeah, what, what's it? It's an interesting market. I don't know. I've been to Vegas obviously, but no, yeah. don't know much about like, what it's like to live there or what like the office right. behavior is. Well, it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing to live here. I must tell you, as you can see behind me, we're pretty much sunny skies all the time. Wait, we what's the official- temperature today? Today, I think we are in the low to mid nineties. So we're oh, finally sub a hundred. Yeah. Okay. Like, well, for me, oh. I like it. I'm from like Chicago, and if okay. I never see the snow again, I'll be That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then anywhere outside of, uh, you know, the Vegas area, you got the humidity. I've been to Dallas before, and where you know, it's 95 the- and humid, right? And yeah. you're you're pointing yeah. to your hair, this, and there's this, never a good hair day in yeah. Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> this hairdo, pre- yeah. This hairdo prefers the desert <laughs> climate. So anyway. Um, but the Vegas market, um, you know, we're definitely seeing on the, you know, the residential side, probably like most other places, uh, is is softening a bit with higher interest rates. Uh, but what yeah. we saw during, um, you know, the the shutdown was that people were coming here from California in droves. So our I have two um, friends from they were from my CrossFit gym who moved to Vegas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a really good, it's a really good life out here. I, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. Our, the climate, the mountains, everything it's, you know, 
um, to me, very, very livable. And uh, it's, it's really become, my whole family lives out here now. So the whole, you know, siblings, my mom, yeah. everyone, everyone yeah. moved out here. And uh, it's really, it's really become the land of opportunity. It really, um, there's a lot of opportunity out here if you're willing to work hard and, and meet the people and become ingrained in the community. So um, the commercial market is still super strong. There's still a lot of investment money out there. So, you know, it's, it's softened a little bit. I'm hearing from uh, my friends in the corporate commercial real estate, you know, based on rates um, that some of, uh, you know, some of these deals are going sideways or there's some retrading happening uh, on some of the larger portfolio deals, but uh, it's still, I mean, it's, they cannot build buildings fast enough. Construction costs are so high. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the the commercial real estate market, and um, just as a uh, a mention of Michael Abrams, who has been a, a recent addition into my life through you, and just a, a wonderful source uh, of information. Being on uh, calls with him and hearing him talk about you know, the CBDs, right? The, yeah. cent the central business districts getting, you know, decimated and people leaving because now they can go wherever they want. Now that, you know, more people are remote and stuff like that in Vegas, I mean, our buildings, the new construction buildings, they're pre-lease. They're, um, you super know. Super interesting. I saw yeah. a report. I was on the Avis and Young. I was just grabbing their URL for something, for a podcast uh, for my show notes. And, and they had a report about CBD occupancy and mm -hmm. I clicked on it and the numbers are still really awful compared mm -hmm. to February, 2020, like mm -hmm. down, I think the, like the median or the average, I can't remember what they posted was almost 60%, like less mm -hmm. than wow. pre pandemic, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So Vegas is not really, what, what do you think drives that? What's, why do you think downtown Vegas is doing well relative to other major cities? I think, uh, again, it's just the, the flight to, uh, I guess, quality of life. I mean, yeah. I, uh, since I, I haven't really lived anywhere other than Chicago uh, and Vegas, really. So for me, it's, you know, I think to myself, well, you know, what I, if I went back to Chicago to the city itself, you know, um, am I living in a high rise building? Am I in elevators with people? Am I, you know, you've got your weather element and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, do we need to be in, in this building? Um, so I kind of like how people are talking about that hub and spoke model yeah. where maybe headquarters is still, uh, you know, in the metropolitan area. Yeah. So do, bit... do you think it's HQs that are opening in Vegas? Like you mentioned kind of strong construction and pre-leasing. Who is that? Do you think? Well, it's also, our, I think our, the tax climate of mm -hmm. Nevada, you know, we're a no yeah. state income tax, uh, in our, uh, you know, governor's office of economic development. They're just really, they've always been very active in getting people from yeah. the high tax state to, uh, to Vegas. Yeah. So. That's interesting. Yeah. That makes sense. So the pandemic probably accelerated that a little bit, which yeah, yeah makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay. I want to go back to your 4,000 feet to 20,000 mm -hmm. feet. Yeah. What, so what was it that you know, kind of made you take the leap and were there, you kind of did a similar pre-existing building, not mm -hmm. starting from scratch. Um, any other considerations like, okay, now that I've lived with this 4,000 foot space, here's what I want, you know, mm -hmm. out of the next location. Well, I think it was really just knowing and from listening to, you know, the podcasts of, of, the uh, the wiser ones who've come before me of um you know really you you have to scale in order to make that profit so in Summerlin you know in 4,000 square feet we do well but there's not a whole lot more to go from there right there's only so many offices you can rent and conference room bookings so the larger you go the more options you have uh, with the space and it was um you know, finding, um, you know, a, a building that, that 
we can grow uh, the space in um, and, and just putting your faith in the fact that if you build it, they will come. So, um, you know, uh, the first go around was really difficult. The ramping up period, um, you know, just trying to explain to people what is co-working, what is flexible office space. They, you know, yep. um, so now that a lot of people are educated for better or worse about co-working and, and the players in the co-working space. Um, I, I, you know, now more people are seeking, uh, you know, co-working flexible office and just, I guess that, you know, goes to how you position yourself, um, you know, all the, all the topics that you cover, right. How to best position yourself for, you know, the incoming traffic or, you know, for the interest in, uh, in co-working space. So, um, yeah, it was just one of those, um, you know, opportunities that came up where, you know, we were looking at maybe an 8,000 square foot space, a 10,000 square foot space, but one of them was like a, a unit within a larger building. So now you've got to deal with common areas yeah. and sharing that with other people. And then um, already you're, you know, you just, you already see that you're out of space. So like as a, as a real estate broker and someone who worked for office developers, people would buy like a little office condo thinking this is all the space I need. But then you realize once you move into it, you've already outgrown it. So it was just um, we're really bad at predicting, right? We're bad at right. predicting. So the I, the whole flexibility, the ability to expand, mm -hmm. is one of the big benefits for of co working. Yeah, and I've and I've been to co working uh, conferences. I think I was in one in um, Toronto, the um, Juicy, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, shout out to Liz and Stormy as well. Um, uh, I was at a, a, a conference and uh, they were um, talking about the um, uh, the the build out of the space and maximizing what uh, what you have. I was like lost my train of thought there on that one. Um, the let's see as I was giving the shout out. Hold on. I know I'm going backwards too. <laughs> Wait, we were talking about more space, what you do with space. I might've lost it too. <laughs> Sorry. It'll, it'll come back. It'll, yes, I'm sure it'll come back. I know. Um, I'm, trying well, to, I'm trying to give shout outs to people. And I know. Too. No, that's funny. It'll, I'm sure it'll come back as soon as we start talking about <laughs> something else. Um, okay. The atrium, what type of events yeah. have you done in the atrium? Okay, so the atrium space, um, we have, um, you know, what's nice about the atrium space is that it gives the entry space to the rest of the office. So uh, you uh, walk into the atrium space and it's like a nice reception area for other people. And then you, um, you know, can move back into the classroom or into one of the other conference room spaces as well. So the atrium space, um, we have it um, outfitted for um, couches, tables, we've got a custom table um, that we had a local uh, person make uh, here. And so we, um, you know, have that, uh, you know, flexibility up there for people to use the space It opens out onto a beautiful patio. Um, so you can do like an indoor outdoor kind of thing. We were going to do a coffee cart, like coffee bar kind of concept. Oh, that's to it. right. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. And so, uh, we were going to do that concept, but then the further we got down the road with that, it was like, you have to saw cut the floor and, uh, Ooh, you plumbing. know, run in plumbing. Yeah. Or if, if you build the cart yourself. Uh, do you have to, uh, you know, now you've got to put tanks in there. And now if you have tanks, you have to have an agreement with a commissary to come swap your, you know, water in yep. and out and, uh, and stuff like that. So the, um, what we're working on right now 
is, you know, because we serve locally roasted coffee, which is very important to me. So we serve um, locally roasted coffee, um, but I'd like to expand that coffee menu. And we don't have the coffee shop component to it because yep. clearly I have enough I can't on get my a mind. cappuccino with the coop. <laughs> <laughs> clearly I have enough on my mind to where I can't uh, possibly run another business out of yeah. here. But um, so now we're working with a local coffee company who just got a coffee truck. So we're going to have Ooh, them. Yep. Yeah. And have them do a stop. It, and that's the thing. It's giving people that um, platform to do what they do, which is, you know, what, what the co-working space is. We, we run, um, you know, we give people that platform uh, to run their businesses. And so to allow a new startup coffee company to test the water with her coffee concept and also bringing more services yeah. to um, you know, to the members of the co-working But in space. a flexible way, flexible services mm -hmm. for your flexible audience. Yes. Yeah. That's, I forgot. Cause you, so it's a freestanding building, mm -hmm. but it's in an office park. Cause you had mentioned, you thought. Exactly. Yep. Just, yeah. Yep. So we have, um, we are in more of a, an industrial area in this location, all that we are an office building and we are surrounded class by. Class A, is it a um, class A building? I mean, I guess per, per my standards, yeah. yes, of course, okay. but if you're talking, you know, BOMA, you yeah. know, real estate standards, I mean, class A is more of, you know, like full service amenities, yeah. you, okay. know, you know, stuff like that. So but it's not I an industrial building. I, I might call it class A if I saw it yes. in terms yes. of it's yeah, looking. Yeah. Good. So okay. we are definitely, yeah, we are not a flex we're not flex building. We do not have yep. an industrial component to the yep. building, but we are in an area because we are close, closer to the strip. We are surrounded by other buildings that w might service the construction industry, okay. the strip and uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Dana, maybe co-warehousing next. I'm super interested I, in that model. <laughs> honestly, it is one of the things I'm thinking of. Um, yeah. I think there's, uh, like there's great, you're going to outsource the coffee idea, but maybe, maybe that we, exactly. I, I'm trying to do a podcast Well, I'm working on a, um, like a, a, how I did this session on it, because I think it's really interesting. K do you know, Kane Wilmot? Did you meet Kane? Yeah. In yeah. I've met Kane oh, at, lovely. um, it, uh, I think a couple of your conferences, probably he's always yeah. there and he's been on the podcast a couple of times, but we were at the conference and he went to visit a salt box and literally at the like seventies party, we're like mm -hmm. in the corner. I'm like, okay, let's reverse engineer it. Tell me what the numbers yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, uh, yes, I toured Kane's place in, uh, I believe it was in Toronto. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. For juicy. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Great. Um, yeah. Okay. and I will anyway, remember, yeah. I will remember the, the point of, uh, of the juicy Toronto that came up. And <laughs> I know we'll go. Up. So do you control your door access since you have a freestanding building? We do. So, yeah. um, the, the coop Summerlin doors are locked 24 seven. Okay. Um, that's just the nature of how it's built out there. We use a uh, key C door access, uh, for our doors and they're fantastic. Uh, and then, um, we also have key C access for, uh, the coop South. But our front door is open nine to five because we are staffed up front. So um, that was just easier. There's more, you know, foot traffic and, and stuff like that with all of our increased, you know, conference rooms and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, got it. So could the atrium do like a wedding or are we talking more like cocktail hour? I'm thinking cocktail hour. I mean, it's, the atrium's not that big. We're maybe, okay. I don't know, a thousand square feet down there, yeah. maybe 1200 square feet. So, um, you know, what, what we like about that space is giving people, I mean, it's, it's a, it's really a wow factor in the atrium space. So people come in, yeah. we have a big monitor with rotating scrolls of, uh, the com nice. company logos and upcoming events and stuff like that. And then, um, it's, uh, just, you know, it's more of a casual, you know, we allow people nights and weekends, um, to do, you know, their meetings and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, so it's like a nice kind of reception area and then it gives people the option to, you know, change 
their venue of like, well, let's, let's now go back into the classroom yeah. or let's go, yeah. uh, you know, into one of the large conference rooms or something like that. But it's, a, it's a very nice, uh, casual space. It's, it's really what I wanted to, the kind of environment that I wanted to work in post corporate commercial yeah. real estate was, um, you know, just that professional yet approachable, yeah. Um, you know, environment where people just feel at home. Yeah. So I also, I like that point because, um, you know, we were talking about the monetization of space and how an atrium is (laughs) because atrium is rentable square feet, but not usable square feet. Did I Mm -hmm. get that right? Like you're paying for it essentially, but because it's big, a big open space, it's not as usable. Um, Right. It's one of those things. I think that it's, like yeah can you directly you know it's one of the it's like you you have to be able to offer additional things that might not you know directly monetize or something like right but But to your point you know you kind of made the point that um you so somebody brought this up in the facebook group they were taking out their couches because no one sits on the couches and i was like Mm -hmm. wait a second Maybe they don't sit on the couches, but maybe they like the fact that there are couches, Mm -hmm. right? Kind of like, like the events, like it's difficult. I think in this business to really, like, you can't strip everything down to only what people use because it's not necessarily about that. Right. They, your point, you're like, I can tell you love the atrium. You love walking Mm -hmm. in, you love how it feels. You like, Mm -hmm. you know, you love sitting there and greeting people when they come in Mm -hmm. and that's a big deal. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that is part of the equation. The numbers have to work, right. You Mm -hmm. you can't, you can't do a deal with an atrium and not be able to make money, Mm -hmm. but there are things, there are, um, intangibles, that mm-hmm. come with things like that, that sometimes are important. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, you know, it, it seems, and, and I, I know you had have talked before about, uh, you know, it's, it's about the private offices, right? People, they think, you know, co-working is just open space. I wouldn't be interested in co-working because I need my own private office. And it's like, well, we have a lot of private offices. It's more of, you know, the, people like their private offices, but they like having access to the open space. Right. Sometimes they just want to pop out and say hi and, you know, chit chat a little bit, stretch the legs uh, before getting back in front of their computer. So it's nice to be able to offer something like that. And it really is to me, the, the atrium space and then the open space uh, in Summerlin, those are really the, the heart of the space. So yeah. that's where the, that's where the connections happen. That's where you build the, the community. Yeah. So you have to have them totally. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, are both, so you said the new location is, are they both staffed, both locations staffed? Yes. Both locations are staffed. And that's something that I needed to, uh, you know, I still grapple with that because I'm not sure if it's come across in, uh, in our our interview but i'm not the most organized person so i have a lot of stuff swirling around up here and sometimes i think when we have a lot of our own ideas we feel unorganized but Mm -hmm. you're you're obviously (laughs) you're getting some things done dana i'm not totally worried about your your (laughs) organizational skills thank you i need you to call me every morning (laughs) totally i'll give you a pep talk yeah like cat like cat johnson she would text me she's like you're killing it girl (laughs) thanks um, sometimes we just need to hear that, but, um, so the, um, uh, what were you, oh, so the, what I had, um, struggled with is the delegating, right? Mm-hmm. Once it, once it came time to, okay, we're doing this, we're doing the second location. Cause out of the first location, I'm running my, the co-working space. Space, and I'm also doing my commercial real estate, mom of two, right. you know, we've got all the stuff I'm on organizations and volunteering and stuff like that. And we're just, you know, it's, you know, that became increasingly difficult to manage all of that. And it's just really surrounding yourself with good members in the co-working space who can give you a hand when you need it. And then um, once I opened up 
myself, it became clear. You, there's no way. So then it's like, okay, well now you have to hire. Well, I, I've worked in corporate, but always as an independent contractor. So I'm not used to hiring and HR and all of that stuff. So it's really leaning on people to help you, uh, you know, figure that out. So um, I staffed um, uh, Summerlin, uh, with I've got a full time person in Summerlin now, and then I have um, Kelly, who you met. She came on board when we opened up Coop South, um, and that was, um, you know, a, a godsend really, because she's, you know, she helps me with run the software and, um, you know, do the do the day to day at South, of which you know, twenty thousand square feet more conference room space, yeah. more members, yep. more, more, you know, everybody through the space, everyone yeah. has needs. Yeah. And so I had, um, I had Matthew in Summerlin and then he recently left and now Trudy is there, uh, in Matthew's place. Um, so I do have people staffing both, but still during the day you're getting texts and phone calls of, you know, what to do, what am I, you know, and I'm doing the commercial real estate thing and, you know, all of that stuff too. So it's, uh, it's still, it's like, you know, more, more spaces, more, <laughs> more headspace. It takes more up. going on in your brain. Wait, so what does your um, commercial real estate role look like? What do you help clients with? I pretty much do everything in commercial real estate. So I do um, office, industrial, retail. I do land. I've done entitlements for people where we do ground up construction. Um, so yeah, and it's really, um, I kind of stumbled into real estate when I was 22 in Chicago. And um, it, it was just, uh, it really became a passion soon after working in development for some of the loft developers in downtown Chicago. And I think I've always wanted to be a developer and opening the coop really allowed me to do that in a small way. It's like to, mm -hmm. to build something. I yeah. don't know. I, I feel like yep. when you come from corporate, corporate commercial real estate, or just the corporate world, you just kind of have that thought of where if you weren't here working this listing, if you weren't handling this file, if you weren't, we could find 50 other people to do it right away. And the co-working space, it's really independent. I don't want to say independent, some independent business owners, remote workers, you know, the whole, the whole gamut of people, but it's really just working in a space on your terms and hopefully giving people that feeling that, that they matter. You being yeah. here matters. Yep. So. so I'm reading this book that I need to, it's one of those books I need to finish and then start over and like take notes. But I got to this chapter yesterday where he's talking about how like we all really value being on our own schedule and having our own time and this whole like time freedom concept. And, and, you know, that's a lot of what people want post pandemic now that they feel like they're allowed to ask for it. But one of the trade-offs of that is like, everybody's like on their own schedule. He's mm -hmm. like, there's so much value in people, like almost that like we might want it so much mm -hmm. that we become disconnected to people, yeah. which makes mm -hmm. complete sense to me. And I thought like, this is what co-working solves, yeah. right? Like it solves so many things, but I think mm -hmm. that's not just the, it's, it's kind of the loneliness thing, but this like, yeah. well, we need independence because like, as a mom, you want to be able to go deal with your kids, stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. it can't be irrationally strict. And yet mm -hmm. the structure of things is sometimes mm -hmm. like how you interact, like how you cross paths with people, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah, it's interesting. And so like the act of going to an office, and even if we don't, want to be restricted to working nine to five, like, mm -hmm. well, if we all agree, that's what we're going to do together as a mm -hmm. way to have this like feeling of being part of something. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's like, it's philosophical, but it's really resonating with me. 
I agree with you. I've gotten, I've gotten a lot more philosophical, certainly in the past couple of years with what we've all gone through. And I hate to put the, you know, the, the label on what we've gone through because it's time, I feel like it's time to, to move on from that. But, um, you know, um, a lot of the programming I bring into the coop now um, is more geared towards health and wellness and, you know, mental health, where right. it's like, we're, we're talking about, you know, before it's like, how's your QuickBooks? How right. are your numbers? What's the Facebook algorithm? What search terms are you putting in? And at the end of the day, it's just like, how are you? Yeah. Right. Are you okay? And, if, and at the end of the day, a lot of us, aren't or maybe we are one day and we're not the next day so uh, I had an event this past Saturday at the coop in Summerlin which I like Saturdays I my weekends to me that's when I can turn everything off and it's just you don't have to answer every phone call and all of that stuff but I like weekends in that um, you know I can show up to an event in my comfy pants and uh you know and just just relax and just be, and be present. not yeah. not have the distractions that are constantly like something's moving outside of you know the office or something so but this was um this event was called showing up as your authentic self and at first we were gonna you know showing up as your best self and it's like well wait what if I'm not feeling my right. best? can, can <laughs> right. I still show up and hope that other people give me, uh, you know, that deference to say, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, she's, you know, maybe not, you know, uh, functioning at, at, at the peak, but, you know, we're all just, we're all going through it. And that's, uh, that's part of the, you know, the co-working space, uh, the co-working movement is that, yeah, absolutely. It's about dollars and cents and price per square foot. And, you know, does it make financial sense and pro formas and uh, demographics and stuff, but it's also, it's people and they gravitate towards you for a space. I mean, I've, I've had people approach me and well, you know, what makes you better than, uh, you know, one of the other operators in town, why would you, we choose you, uh, you know, and it's like, there's, there's nothing that I can say that would make me better. I would never, you know, talk negatively about, you know, competition out there. It's where, where do you belong? Yeah. You know, where, where do you feel that you belong? Hopefully it's with us because that there's nothing that makes me happier than, uh, you know, people creating relationships uh, at the coop um, and, and, you know, business relationships, friendships. We had a coop wedding. Two oh, I of love our that. Members, I always love those stories. <laughs> two of our members. Yes. Two of our members met and uh, they got married and uh, I signed the marriage license. That's amazing. And that's I mean, does it, does it get any more, No, you know, it's just it, all the, all the hard work that we go through in running the spaces and, and, and all of that, um, because it is, you, you operated co-working spaces too. I mean, it's, it's all in no weddings, Dana. We didn't get, we didn't get to weddings. Uh, <laughs> Maybe well, there's eventually. Still, there's still time for you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really, you know, just, it's, it's such a, it's a multifaceted, uh, you know, uh, with, with co-working. It's really, you know, you have the nice space and the financials hopefully work for people, the numbers work for people, but what, what gets them to stay? And that's the part that, um, that I'm trying to work hard on is the, what, what makes people belong. So I think that's the perfect ending. Uh, I have more questions to ask you. We might have to do a round two, but I realize mm -hmm. I have now kept you over our time. So <laughs> <laughs> you might have a kid to pick up or something yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was great to hear your story. And thank you for sharing your experience and your insight and for taking the time to do that. Thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's such an honor uh, to be asked to be a part of, uh, of your podcast. Yeah. Well, the honor is all mine. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> Thank you.